Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 25, Part 2 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we complete the deep dive into August of 1968. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video description, where you will find links to related videos, Hendrix performances and stunning photographs from the period. Also, remember to subscribe for new content drops and channel notifications. Wednesday the 21st of August, and the group performs at the Civic Dome, Virginia Beach, Virginia performing two shows. Set list for the first show, Are You Experienced, Red House, Foxy Lady, Little Wing, Purple Haze, Hey Joe, Wild Thing, and Voodoo Child. Slight return. Friday the 23rd of August, and the Jimi Hendrix Experience performs at the New York Rock Festival, Singer Bowl, Flushing Meadow Park, Queens, New York. Set list for the concert was as follows. Are you experienced? Fire. Red House. I don't live today. Foxy Lady Like a Rolling Stone. Purple Haze. Star Spangled Banner. Hey Joe and Wild Thing. After the concert, Jimmy takes part in a jam session with Joe Tex. Also that day, the experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers. It Magazine, August 23rd to September 5th, edition. Go Magazine, August 23rd edition. And Berkeley Barb. August 23rd to 29th edition. The following review appeared in The New York Times by Robert Shelton. There was an air of tenseness surrounding the New York Rock Festival Friday night at Singer Bowl in Flushing Meadows Park, Queens. An overflow audience of 18,000 turned out to hear Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, the Chambers Brothers and the Soft Machine. The previous festival meeting on August 2nd ended with a chair throwing melee, so everyone was braced for trouble although it never developed. About 70 special guards failed to report, and several dozen city policemen were called in. Matters were not helped by cramming in an additional 1,000 standees. Many of the ushers didn't have a clue as to where the numbered seats were, and were surly about their ignorance. Glaring stadium lights during most of the evening heightened the crisis atmosphere. The announcer, Scott Muni, skillfully kept the proceedings somewhat tranquilized. There were three attempts by individuals to charge onto the stage, but matters were quickly put under control. Evening star, Mr. Hendrix, gave an exciting performance with his trio, but he marred it with a concluding violent onslaught, ramming his guitar through the fabric of a loudspeaker. When are such rock stars as Mr. Hendrix and The Who going to realize such twisted showmanship is unhealthy and unnecessary? Apart from Mr. Hendrix's segment, the evening was not distinguished musically. The Chambers brothers, showing up late again, continue to rely on their three or four routine rousers. They clearly need to broaden their material. That great singer, Miss Joplin, was not in top form. She was not mixing too well with her quartet, Big Brother, and The Holding Company. Apart from his furious finale, Mr. Hendrix continues to be one of the most compelling performers working these days. His blues wailing, and his guitar virtuosity are unparalleled, and his extroverted showmanship is a brilliant form of total musical theatre. But again, why tear the theatre down? Eh? While this commentary appeared in The Village Voice by Annie Fisher, note references to the revolving stage. That the house is Jimi Hendrix's is clear the minute he comes in sight, with that funny, private, oddly modest bearing he has when he's not playing. Audience is up and shouting. He wipes his nose with a Confederate flag. The monster lights are finally dimmed. The lazy Susan is backside to us for the first two numbers. Our turn we get a slow blues. Groovy. He's getting better than $500 a minute for this show one hour, and that's not an inflated price. He's worth it, but he shouldn't be playing this date. Rock outside is a gas, but stadium concerts should be left to groups like The Rascals or The Four Seasons, not anyone who has original musical ideas. We get another good look at the back of the equipment as they do Foxy Lady. Then they revolve back to us. A kid who's been sitting quietly on the steps of the stage. What are those kids doing there anyway? unexpectedly dashes onto the carousel. The house lights blast back on. In a flash, two equipment men get him back to the steps. Mike Jeffrey, Hendrix's manager, who hasn't been visible all night, and Jerry Stickles, his road manager, who has been in his usual beleaguered pose, are instantly at the foot of the steps. The music never stops. The kid lies down. Stickles wants him off stage altogether. Kid protests angrily. Cop pulls kid off a little force there. I'm looking back at the carousel to see how the musicians are faring. So I miss what happens next. Horrified, the girl next to me says, My God, all those cops on that one kid. 
Awful things are happening at another corner of the stage in the audience. It's the same kid, and I see a cop among what looked like three dozen solid, forcing the kid to the ground by using a nightstick some way on his shoulders. As suddenly as it started, it's all over. A phalanx of uniforms hustling out the musician's entrance, the kid apparently in the middle, the barricade apparently back in place. So the question is now whether Jimmy will go ahead with his freak-out climax. Earlier, he had eaten his guitar. Yeah, he finishes it off, a sort of subdued version, charging his equipment, guitar neck first, carefully deflecting so as not to really bust the speakers or his axe, then squatting obscene across the axe. Merry go round, 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 round. For what? He's a genius. What's he need that corn for? You don't really think he plays with tongue and teeth, do you? After all, you've seen him hold his guitar at arm's length and play one-handed with his fingers on the neck. Well, it sells a lot of seats to people who could care less about the music. They ate it up on Friday. And if there's plenty of music going down besides, there's really nothing wrong with selling seats if you weren't born so affluent. You can disdain what money can buy if mummy can't. Anyway, it's a put-on, and I think he probably has fun doing it and sharing the fun. If you're experienced, of course, it doesn't have anything to do with the music, because Jimi Hendrix is a genius. While Rat Subterranean News featured the following piece, what was expected to be the super show of the summer, turned out instead to be only the most vulgarly sensational and poorly managed. The major problem was the entire concept of the theatre in the round staging. The whole stage would revolve, sometimes in the middle of a number, throwing the performers off balance and preventing the backstage half of the audience from seeing. This was especially painful during the Jimi Hendrix show. See him pluck out America, the beautiful on the guitar with his teeth. See him having sex with his guitar before your unbelieving eyes. See him shake that thing. And as a finale, you'll watch in horror and amazement as Jimmy attacks the amplifiers with the neck of his guitar. Cheap trills should have been reserved as the trademark for the Jimi Hendrix experience. You could hear shrieks and other weird response from the other side of the stadium, and you knew he was doing something dirty. But all you could see was the wall of amps. The police were another obstacle. They were out in force as usual, concentrated in groups around the stage. At the beginning of the concert, a beefy woman who looked like a police matron or a washerwoman circulated among the cops, dispensing wads of cotton from a huge ball, which they quickly stuffed in their ears. They weren't going to let any of that evil music get in to confuse their minds. Later, they proved that nothing had gotten through by almost starting a riot after roughing up some kid who rushed on stage to get close to Hendrix. The pigs massed four deep along one side of the stage, while the audience in the area flashed V-signs and hurled small objects, united in a feeling against a common enemy for a common music. The show itself was a little too familiar. Everyone did their usual thing. Hendrix put on a déjà vu performance with one exception. That was his version of Like a Rolling Stone which, while not fantastic, was strong and made me reappreciate Dylan's song and Hendrix's voice. Mainly, it was a departure from the established Hendrix program, which needs some departures. Axis, Bold as Love is a fine second album, showing Jimmy knows how to move forward and not just stand still like a hummingbird, proving he can do something besides overblown super songs like Purple Haze. Hendrix is justly proud of this progress in his sound, and we can expect a further step in the new album, but in concert he seems frozen at some point in time a year or two ago. Soul on Ice. And from Billboard, by Fred Kirby, the program of the New York Rock and Roll Festival at Singer Bowl more than lived up to advance billing as the Jimi Hendrix experience gave one of its finest local performances to date to complete the strong program. The lack of serious technical problems is what made Hendrix always an exciting performer, even better than in many previous local appearances. As the reprise trio took time to set up, Hendrix promises to make it up in spades. He apparently was referring to his previous New York appearance at Fillmore East 10th of May, when constant static hindered an otherwise fine effort. His bluesy singing was first-rate, his guitar playing superb and his stage presence, electric. From the opening are you experienced? Every number hit the mark. An unusual aspect of the set was the singing along by members of the audience. At first this was only slight, but by the time the group hit Purple Haze, it was widespread. A minor disturbance during Hey Joe didn't interrupt a strong wailed version. The disturbance, however, resulted in the lights being turned up. Hendrix, with superb aplomb, asked the audience to join with him in singing Wild Thing. Hendrix ended this final number with guitar playing of other themes, including a wrong note star spangled banner. Among the other good numbers were Foxy Lady Fire and Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone.
Hendrix, one of the top echelon of today's pop guitarists, stole the show. The vastness of Singer Bowl seemed congenial to the trio's highly amplified sound. Whether erect or on the floor, calm or physically assaulting the amplifiers, his playing was outstanding. And Hendrix, who has jammed with many other groups, clearly relishes playing, especially as well as he played on August 23rd. Saturday the 24th of August sees the band performing at the Bushnell Memorial Hall, Hartford, Connecticut. Henry McNulty interviewed the experience. This is his recollection. I worked for the Hartford Current, Connecticut's biggest newspaper, for more than 25 years. When I started, I was just 22 years old. In 1968, the Hartford Current had no tradition of interviewing or reviewing rock stars or any type of pop music stars, so my doing so was really a departure for the newspaper. The editor insisted that any story be intelligible to adults as well as to young people, which is why there's a lot of what seems to be needless explanation. Before I interviewed Jimi Hendrix, I was told that he didn't like reporters, so I was very polite and careful in approaching him. To my surprise and pleasure, he turned out to be pleasant, a real gentleman. He didn't say that any of my questions were stupid, although probably some of them were, and he and the band willingly posed for pictures. He was careful to ask that I include Noel and Mitch in the interview too, saying that he didn't want it just to be about himself. All in all, he seemed to be an intelligent and modest person, and the concert was great. The only thing I regret is that I didn't ask for his autograph. The interview was as follows. Jimi Hendrix bore a marked resemblance to a witch as he played Saturday night at Bushnell Memorial. For one thing, he is thin, pencil thin, and he was dressed in black with silk cuffs a foot around. For another, he wails like a witch and stalks mysteriously around the stage. But the greatest point of resemblance is that his music totally charmed the standing, room-only Bushnell crowd. As Jimmy played his well-known hits and other standards, the audience sat and stared, many bug-eyed. Saturday's Nights was a mature audience, nary a teeny bopper in the house. And Jimmy knew it. He played deliberately and unsmilingly and refused to clown with the audience. He didn't have to. Jimmy's two fellow witches are Noel Redding, bassist, and Mitch Mitchell, drummer. They are solid and as competent as can be reasonably expected, but Hendrix is the star and the others are the sorcerer's apprentices. It is they who give Jimmy a beat and richness, but it is Hendrix who has the magic potion to turn Mulligan stew into a bewitching brew. Who else but the great Jimi Hendrix can hold a guitar at arm's length and still keep playing with one hand? Who else can slide a guitar against a microphone stand and have as a result good music? Who else can play the Star Spangled Banner with his teeth? Sunshine of Your Love was sensational Hendrix style. Jimmy claimed he forgot the words, and indeed he didn't sing, but vocal singing was unnecessary. The use of his wah-wah made the guitar sing for him. After a generous hour and a half performance, Jimmy offhandedly smashed an amplifier, tossed his guitar backstage, and went off to thunderous applause. Jimi Hendrix is so insistent that his group has the word experience tacked on the end that he wrote his own introduction at the Bushnell Saturday night. If they just say Jimi Hendrix, then somebody might think it's just me all alone, he said. But this was clearly not his main reason for insisting on dictating the introduction. Jimmy has great respect for Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, the other members of the experience, and he hates to see them left out of anything. He requested that they be present, and he left a comfortable chair to pose with them for pictures. But despite all Jimmy's efforts, He's so different from Noel and Mitch that it is difficult to think of them as one unit. Jimmy is an American Negro. Noel and Mitch are British Caucasians. Jimmy speaks thoughtfully and quietly, hardly ever smiling, while Noel and Mitch are loquacious and chummy. On stage, Jimmy plays a loud, commanding lead while Noel and Mitch fill in the needed background. It doesn't really bother me if people say Jimi Hendrix when they mean all of us, Mitch said. But sometimes it does get a little irritating. I mean, everyone is a separate person. Mitch used to play with Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames. When the Blue Flame began to flicker, I left, he explains. Mitch and Noel were seated on a couch in one of the Bushnell's dressing rooms. They sat between two young girls. Noel talked about the Small Faces, an English group who have released only one record in the United States. They're really great, far above most routine stuff, he said. Both Mitch and Noel refused to classify the experience as music. I hate it when they call us one thing or another. How do they know what we do? Besides, we change a little bit every time we play, said Mitch. Turned on psychoplasmic vibrations, said Noel. That sort of thing leaves me cold. Why bother classifying? While Noel and Mitch ate chicken with the two girls, Jimi Hendrix sat in a chair smoking and chatting. 
He was dressed in a flowing black shirt with drooping cuffs and black bell-bottom trousers with a silver design on one side. Jimmy spoke in a voice barely louder than a whisper. He spoke earnestly, especially about his music. Any kind of an audience is the right kind so long as they can listen. I do the best I can even if they don't care. But a really good audience, one that listens and understands, turns me on. Jimmy said he listens to all types of music. He declined to state any preference for artists, though he said he has enjoyed organist E. Power Biggs playing Bach. Then he began talking with a young man about music. They discussed guitars, amplifiers and special devices such as wah-wah and fuzz tone. Fuzz tone and wah-wah are connected to the amplifier. The performer turns them on and off with foot pedals. Both names are self-explanatory. Fuzz tone blurs the music and wah-wah makes each guitar note sound as if it was saying wah-wah-wah. Those things used to be crutches, but not anymore, Jimmy said. Now they're useful tools. If they are tools, Jimmy is a master artisan. On stage, he is as quiet and careful as in an interview session. Until the end of the performance, he doesn't wave his guitar in the air and play it behind his back. At the end, he does. Seven-eighths of the time he is on stage, Jimmy stands virtually still, his eyes closed, his mouth slightly open. At a particularly moving moment, he will grimace slightly, but the wild histrionics don't appear until the last numbers. Then Jimmy plays the guitar with his teeth behind his back, under his legs, and held at arm's length. He smashes an amplifier, behind which a stagehand makes sure nothing tips over, and tosses the guitar over the amps. The curtain comes down. Jimmy lit up a cigarette and drank coke. He cautiously fingered the smashed amp to see how much damage was done. He peered over the amp at the stagehand, who was picking up the guitar. What happened? he asked. Not much, said the hand. Mmm, that's why I threw it into the curtain and not on the floor, Jimmy said. Mitch Mitchell headed immediately for the dressing room while Noel Redding stood backstage talking to members of the Ira Apparent, an Irish group sponsored by Hendrix, who travel with the experience. Then Jimmy finished his coke and gently floated off stage, leaving almost 3,000 fans experienced. Sunday the 25th of August and the Jimi Hendrix Experience performed two shows at the Carousel Theatre, Framingham, Massachusetts. Set list for the first show. Johnny B. Good, Are You Experienced? Hey Joe, Sunshine of Your Love, Foxy Lady, Fire, Purple Haze, The Star Spangled Banner, and Wild Thing. And second show, Johnny B. Good, Spanish Castle Magic, Fire, Are You Experienced? Purple Haze, Hey Joe, and Wild Thing. Monday the 26th of August, sees the experience performing at the Kennedy Stadium, Bridgeport, Connecticut. The following review appeared in the Bridgeport Telegram and Post, preceded by the era apparent, who did the worst baby blue ever, and Gloria with a great deal of noise but no control whatsoever, and the soft machine with an excellent drummer, but otherwise no more impressive than the Irish group, Jimi Hendrix and his two co-conspirators played several of their better-known numbers with enough amplification to drown out their virtuosity. When he strode out onto the portable theater, demanding sotto voce of his bass guitar player, where are we, man? Bridgeport. And then, welcome to Bridgeport. He seemed much shorter, skinnier than we had expected, and one really couldn't hear his voice for the whining and droning of his guitar. He opened with, Are you experienced? Continued through Foxy Lady. Hey, Joe, and Spanish Castle Magic, somewhat lacking in his legendary verve. The Hendrix experience have built their popularity upon album sales. They have yet to produce a top ten song. Purple Haze comes closest to being their best-known number, as their finale it was their best and most appreciated. What is initially disappointing about Hendrix, as well as the other groups with him last night, is the deafening electric cacophony which at close range clouds the air so thickly with twang that the tune, and there always is a tune, is lost. And the precautionary overlighting and over-policed atmosphere of the show added nothing to the performance. Nevertheless, Hendrix is one of the best, and the concert the best attended in Kennedy Stadium this season, and no one else can truly sing Hey Joe or Foxy Lady like him. After the Bridgeport show, the group drives back to New York, and Jimmy is joined by Joan Baez and others in attending the Operation Airlift by Afra Benefit, being held at the Scene Club. The benefit was to raise funds for the transport of relief supplies to Biafra. The airlift was the first major civilian airlift in history, and perhaps the most significant of all civil relief efforts of any kind. Lita Eliscu from the East Village Other newspaper in a piece which appeared in the 6th of September edition wrote, It was the scene. Everybody was there hoping that this one or that one would also show, friends and people to know. Jimi Hendrix had shown, Joan Baez, 
John Hammond, the Chambers brothers, everybody was on for helping Biafra. Jimi Hendrix does an Ed Sullivan job from the tables. He waves and smiles, stands up and mumbles. He has forgotten to bring his guitar, but hi there anyway, sports fans, son of the Big Bopper has arrived. Also that day, the experience is featured in the KXOA Music Scene magazine, August 26th edition. Tuesday, the 27th of August, and the group is back at the record plant, working on the recordings for Gypsy Eyes and Come On, Part 1. Jimmy plays percussion on the Fat Mattress, Noel Redding's band, track How Can I Live. Noel Redding recalled, On the 27th of August, we worked from early evening until 10 the next morning. We blew the next day as a result. The words day and night had no meaning. Day was whenever we happened to be awake. Wednesday, the 28th of August. The Pop Music Festival at the Providence, Rhode Island Auditorium, which was scheduled for that evening with Jimi Hendrix and the Zoo on the bill is cancelled, as was the recording session planned for the record plant that day. Thursday, the 29th of August, and the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the Village Voice Underground newspaper. In relation to this period, Noel Redding had this recollection. In late August, we headed west with Vanilla Fudge and Ira Apparent, Few places had anything to offer in after-gig entertainment. We spent more nights in our rooms listening to records and watching our new portable TVs, which were a gift from Warner's. Hotels did not have them then. I kept in touch with real life by watching and loving The Three Stooges and, I admit it, I Dream of Genie and My Favourite Martian until we left our TVs inside the office between a gig and they were nicked. Friday the 30th of August and the group performs at the Patio Gardens, Lagoon, Farmington, Utah. Partial set list, Sunshine of Your Love, Foxy Lady, Fire, Purple Haze, Hey Joe, Star Spangled Banner and Wild Thing. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the following publications. The Great Speckled Bird, Atlanta, August 30th edition, and the Los Angeles Free Press, August 30th edition. Saturday the 31st of August, sees the experience enjoy a long overdue day off, and so that evening, they attended an Everly Brothers concert also at Patio Gardens, Lagoon Amusement Park, in Farmington. Noel recalled, That evening we went to be entertained by the Everly Brothers. This was a definite improvement on our usual after-dark arrival at the airport. We felt much better for our outing. That concludes this installment in the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will begin the deep dive into September 1968 of The Hendrix Story, including the continuing North American tour featuring the Oakland Coliseum, the Hollywood Bowl, Seattle and Vancouver, amongst others, along with more about the recording of their third album, Electric Ladyland. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Until next time.